poverty is defined as just the lack of access to integrated products. So I'm going to break this down for you because sometimes we don't know what's around us and we don't realize what's actually going on. So uh, we're going to take a quick look at the global. We know that 50% um, of this world is female. So 50% of this world, right, they menstruate. Um, of those, uh, of those women, we know that in the United States, um, seven out of ten girls have missed school because of the lack of access to period products. So it's an issue here in the states. We sometimes think of this as just a global issue. We also know that in the United States, half of women in poverty they have to make a choice between period products and purchasing a meal. So it becomes a, a, a this is where it becomes a really high impact thing when they've been disabled from doing their jobs to doing the things that they need to do. Um, also, when we look at girls and menstruators, um, girls who are seven year old, seven years old, ten to fifteen percent of girls start at age seven. So if you're in a low income population, if you are uh, all on, um, you know, at all on. Uh, in a lower income bracket in a tougher neighborhood, we know that that ever jumps up to like 30, 38% between them. Those girls are starting at seven years old. 90% of girls start at age 13. So this is well before they're able to purchase period products, before they're even legal to have a job. Um, so uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got into this. Four years ago, I went to lunch with a friend who was here she was living in South Africa at the time, but we're going to actually hear from her today. Her name is Diana Nelson, and she does Global Advocacy for Peace for Girls, which is a great organization. And we went to lunch, and we were talking kind of about like what this looks like at a global level, you know, what menstruation looks like. And to be honest, I haven't even thought about it before. I've heard a few stories here and there, but I haven't actually like spent any time thinking about what menstruation was like for women around the world. You know, and, and she's going to talk to us about that, so I won't take any of that. She'll do a much better job um, talking about that. But it was such an interesting conversation, like hearing what a real struggle this was for girls and women and administrators in other countries. And um, after that conversation, I knew that I wanted to get involved, I wanted to help. It wasn't the right time in my life. I had a little kids at home, I didn't feel like I could do something internationally. So we started looking at uh, what's going on here in the US. And the US is so great. I love it. You know, it's a great country. And I thought, surely, not that people are going to be good, but, you know, like, surely the U.S. is taking care of this, and, and I'm sure that they, there's going to be nothing to do. Well, we started looking into it. We connected with some policy people in D.C. Um, we, we read some books. One of the authors is going to talk to us today about the she wrote about menstrual policy. And we dig into it, and we see that the IRS, you know, the body that taxes every single item that we purchase, um, has deemed one category of products so necessary that they don't tax it. And that category is medically necessary products. So if something is a prescription drug, if it is a, um, you know, if it's a, something like uh, Advil or Benadryl, something you need like that, Rogaine, Viagra, like those are things that are not taxed. Band-Aids, sunscreen, these are things that are not taxed. What has been left out of that big pool? Menstrual products. Yeah, so we started looking at this and realized that there's this big hole in, in what's being done. And there are other organizations working on it, so we kind of joined with them and work on it at a federal level. And I will just give you a quick update. In 2020, with um, the stimulus package, uh, we got that included as medically necessary with the federal government, which is really exciting. So from there, we started looking at what's going on in our state. You know, we tell the state that wants to take care of its people, it takes a lot of pride in that, and you know, wants to feel like we're doing a good job there. And uh, and this is something, menstrual policy was something that the state of Utah was aware of. And for four years, they had introduced a bill to end the tampon tax, which is the sales tax on menstrual products. And for those four years, this bill went and sat in a committee made up of exclusively men. And it was decided in those committees that this bill would not go on to the floor, that this was not important enough to have a vote. Again, you don't have the same policies where um, some of these men's items remain by our and, and some of these other items were not taxed while well, menstrual products were. So we got to work on it, we got some awesome legislators involved, we got some great groups involved, and um, 
I spent a lot of time in male legislators' offices talking about my home period and telling they were swerving and saying, please don't do anything, stop. <laughs> um, and we did get it included in the um, um, in the year 2000, the end of 2019, there was a big tax overhaul in our state, and we included the tampon tax in there. It's a long story, if you were around and paying attention to that at that time, which if you weren't, I don't know why it was not that exciting. Um, but this did get over, it got overturned. So we had tax-free menstrual products for about a month, and then that went away at the end of January. So at a time like that, um, you know, we, we tried to introduce that bill again, and um, because of the hesitancy to change the tax code at that point, with the, you know, the legislature was a little hesitant about that, it didn't end up going through. And that was a moment where I kind of had to hit the brakes and say, okay, so where are we going from here? Because um, there are a lot of things that need to be done to work on um, menstrual equity, or rather to just recognize menstruation as an actual like, public health issue. Where do we go from here? And it's that moment where um, we started to look at the impact and build out a team they can work on this from uh, a much broader perspective and really take on the issue of getting period products into public schools. Um, because the impact of that for those girls who are not able to purchase period products, again, 68% are missing schools. Missing school because they don't have access. So the impact of that is so immediate and it's also um, a group who is most in need, right? Like we're, we're trying to target that group that's most in need. So we pivoted, built out an incredible team. Um, we also uh, partnered with Sister Goods, Christine Andrus had started on her, uh, has started a fundraising campaign and a product drive and working with the food bank here. So the idea is to marry, like taking care of the immediate need, which is that product piece. Women, girls, menstruators, they need product today. They don't need it in nine months when the legislature decides it, right? They need it today. So we wanted to make sure we're taking care of that and, and at the same time taking care of the long-term need. Because the 60,000, a 60,000 period of I started with the food bank lasts our state three weeks. So we've got to, we've got to have a, a way to deal with this in the long term. Um, so we know that that team and there's been a lot of exciting momentum. And I just want to tell you quickly about a lunch that I went to the other day. We've had the opportunity to kind of go around and talk to different groups about this. And, and it was a lunch where it, there were a lot of um, very kind of high-powered people at this lunch. And um, it was really neat. It was neat to be a part of it and, I, and, and an interesting opportunity to talk to them because I don't know that they're always talking about policy or necessarily thinking about that. And so we chatted about it. I told the story of a woman who was supposed to join me and be my guest in the luncheon. Her name is Sarah. And um, she's a woman who lives in poverty. She's about 45. And she grew up in Salt Lake. She was in the Salt Lake City School District. And she tells the story of growing up and not having access to period products. Unfortunately, her parents were both had addiction issues and were unable to fully care for her. And so instead of going to school, because there was some embarrassment, obviously around not having a product, she would stay home and lay towels on the couch and watch television while um, during those days that she was menstruating. So that was, you know, every day that she menstruated, she was home. And the sad part of that is that Sarah still lives in poverty. The day of this luncheon, I called her that morning to pick her up. I couldn't find her. I called her sister. She didn't know where she went. You know, and, and that's the reality for her. Um, poverty, you know, people living in poverty is such a big, complex issue. Poverty is intergenerational. We don't matter where you're born, where you grow up, who your friends are, um, the educational level of your parents, if you have parents, all of those things. Like, it's really complicated. And we're chipping away at it. But one of the neat things about what we call period poverty is that it is solvable in our lifetime. Like in 10 years, we could be sitting in a certain room, so we both be constantly able to talk about because this is going to be done. You know, and that's one of the things that I find most exciting about this is that it immediately has the ability to kind of like break, um, um, rise the tide for all of these, you know, every girl and every woman in our state. Um, and one other thing I wanted to know is that 
sometimes when we talk about administration and um, it gets pushed into this uh, category of like a women's issue. And um, uh, I think we need to be careful about that because anything that affects 50% of a population is not one group's problem.
for public and to add charter school vouchers. It's huge. Thank you. 